I'd like to welcome you a final time to the third lecture uh, of Professor Fishbane's 1990 Strom series on spiritual death and Jewish religious history. Professor Fishbane concludes the series tonight with a discussion entitled Practicing Death, Rituals of Prayer and Sanctification. Uh, before inviting Professor Fishbane, I'd like to try to reestablish with you uh, the frame of reference of his topic since I suspect that there has been a gap of a few days and that gap might have broken all of our uh, trains of thought. Professor Fishbane has begun to flesh out for us the structure and dynamic of a profound metaphor for the experience of religious ultimacy, a metaphor drawn from the realm of biological and social experience and now applied to the inner life of the spirit, the metaphor of death, disintegration of the self and its attachments to the world, and the hope of radical transformation in that unknown world beyond. He has shown the striking degree to which that metaphor has sustained the spirit of religiously sensitive Jews, whose tradition since biblical times has been so intensely concerned with the primacy of life in this world as the arena for the service of God. As the psalmist has said in words which echo in the liturgy of the synagogue's Hallel service, the dead do not praise God, nor those who go down into silence. But we, and, and that we is the living, we shall praise God from now unto eternity. Hallelujah. What we now learn from Professor Fishbane is that while the dead may not praise God, there is a mysterious way in which the living learn to praise God and to know him by interpreting the most intense experiences of their inner life as a kind of death, a death which is at the very center of our hopes for life. After establishing in his first lecture a set of models by which death serves as a metaphor of religious ultimacy, Professor Fishbane went on in his last presentation to point out how a very specific way of dying, the death of the martyr for the sanctification of the divine name, served in later generations to shape the aspirations of Jews not themselves subject to martyrdom. As he showed us, central rituals of Jewish prayer, including the covenant ceremony of the Shema itself, became opportunities for experiencing in life the sanctifying power of the martyr's death. Those suffering the martyr's death gained life, while those who in life ritually reenact the martyr's sanctification gain a new covenantal life here and now. So before us, thanks to the diligence and sensitivity of Professor Fishbane's fresh research, is a model of a remarkable Jewish piety in which the ultimate negation of life, death, is transformed into a means of experiencing the ultimate which life has to offer us. So that we may reach the conclusion of this analysis without further delay, may I now present to you Professor Michael Fishbane. Thank you, Professor Jaffe for putting some of my words into a very helpful frame of reference. Before I begin, let me thank you all for your patience over this past week. The uh, subject matter, for all of its spiritual intensity and interest, is a difficult one, and um, I'm very gratified for the uh, continuing uh, interest that you've shown. Let me also uh, once again thank uh, Mr. and Mrs. Strom for their support of this lecture series and for the Jewish Studies program, and in particular, Mrs. Dorothy Becker for all the uh, kindnesses that she's shown uh, during this entire week. Uh, as Professor Jaffe indicated, the uh, title tonight is Practicing Death uh, in Jewish Spiritual Life, and what precisely that means um, uh, will be seen shortly. The love and longing for spiritual fulfillment, so characteristic of the quest for God among medieval Jewish philosophers, mystics, and martyrs, is, as we have repeatedly seen, a loving unto death. Of the teachings of love found in the Song of Songs, therefore, none seem so true as the phrase, for love is as strong as death. Indeed, the truest love could only be fulfilled in death be it physical or spiritual. And death was most true as the consummation of religious desire. In a traditional and complex religion like Judaism, 
This goal was the longed-for fulfillment given by divine grace of a lifetime of ritual practice, philosophical training, and spiritual meditation. Nevertheless, grace is unconventional, and it might also happen that this highest point in the religious life might be gained indirectly through an unexpected means, even by the paradoxical transformation of earthly desire. One of the most remarkable documents in Jewish religious literature illustrates just this point. It is cited by Rabbi Elijah Davidas in his great 16th century spiritual compendium called Reshit Chachma, and reports a tradition in the name of Rabbi Isaac of Akko, a 13th century mystic whom we have mentioned several times this past week. In the context of, discuss of discussing the love of God and how one must narrow one's spiritual focus upon God alone for a deep spiritual attachment, the following case is adduced. Thus we learn from one incident recorded by Rabbi Isaac of Akko, a blessed memory, who reported that one day the princess came out of the bathhouse and one of the idle people saw her and sighed a deep wish and said, Who would give me that my wish could be fulfilled and I do with her as I like? And the princess answered and said, That shall come to pass in the graveyard, but not here. When he heard these words, he rejoiced, for he thought that she meant for him to go to the graveyard to wait for her there, and that she would come and he would do with her as he wished. But she did not mean this, but wished to say that only there, in death, great and small, young and old, despised and honored, are all equal. But not here, so that it is not possible that one of the masses should approach a princess. So misunderstanding, that man rose and went to the graveyard and sat there, and devoted all his thoughts to her, and always thought of her form. And because of his very great longing for her, he removed his thoughts from everything sensual and put them continually on the form of that woman and her beauty. Day and night he sat there in the graveyard. There he ate and drank, and there he slept. For he said to himself, If she does not come today, she will come tomorrow. This he did for many days. And because of his separation from the objects of sensation and the exclusive attachment of his, th of his thought to one object, and his concentration and total longing, his soul was separated from the sensual things and attached itself only to the intelligible, until it was separated from all sensual things, including the woman herself, and he communed with God. And after a short time, he cast off all sensual things, and he desired only the divine intellect. And he became a perfect servant and holy man of God, until his prayer was heard, and his blessing was beneficial to all passers-by, so that all the merchants and horsemen and foot soldiers who passed by came to him to receive his blessing, until his fame spread far and wide. This episode is more than a tale of a simpleton and his sexual desire, and it is even more than a parable of a holy fool. The vignette rather teaches us how the path of greatest spirituality may actually result from a transformation of base desire. This point is acknowledged by those who transmitted the incident. For the, report, for the reporter, Rabbi Elijah added that Rabbi Isaac of Akko wrote his account of the deeds of the ascetics, that he who does not desire a woman is like a donkey, or even less than one. The point being that from the objects of sensation, one may apprehend the worship of God. We could hardly put it more boldly. All earthly objects may thus become the material for divine meditation, provided that they are held in mind with single-minded intensity. The way leads from an utter and complete focus on these sensate forms to the divine ideas materialized by them. I have no doubt that this truth was known to earlier devotees of God. Indeed, the paradoxes of Eros reported by Rabbi Isaac of Akko, were also noted by his contemporary Moses Maimonides. In his great legal code, Maimonides wrote the following in his discussion of repentance. And what is the proper love? That 
one love God with a great, excessive, and mighty love until one's soul becomes permanently bound in the love of God like one who is sick of love and cannot distract his mind from the beloved woman but always thinks of her when lying down or rising up, when eating or drinking. Even greater than that should be the love of God in the hearts of his lovers, meditating constantly upon him as he commanded us, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. This is what Solomon meant when he said allegorically, for I am sick of love, and the whole Song of Songs is an allegory on this subject. As you can hear, Maimonides, like Rabbi Isaac, knows of the transformation of love in the devoted service of God. Indeed, you may even perceive here a spiritual transformation of Rabbi Akiva's interpretation of the Shema, the credo of divine unity. Like that tradition, Maimonides says that one should love God with all one's soul, even to the point that God would take the lover's soul. But unlike this ultimate transport, which for Akiva is the death of the martyr in rapture, Maimonides is talking about a pure ecstatic bliss, the death of all sensations and selfhood when one is permanently attached to God. Thus, Maimonides the philosopher also knows what Rabbi Isaac the mystic has portrayed so graphically, that to come to God, one has to cross the barriers of death, that one must dwell in a zone of spiritual death or nullity for the sake of rebirth. There is thus a double form of withdrawal, or hikbodidut. First, there is a physical withdrawal of the body from society and sensuality to a place where all is equal. And then a mental withdrawal, or contraction of the mind, so that it is meditatively fixed upon God alone. Then one comes to a spiritual place where all sensuality has been transcended and all is equal in one's sight. Maimonides' use of the Shema, the credo of faith, as a text to highlight the focus of all one's religious desires has ritual aspects, as we saw in earlier lectures. In particular, we noted that many writers taught that one should recite the Shema daily with the spiritual intention and readiness to die for God. At that moment, out of love for God. This intention, or kavana, already appears in various ritual instructions concerning prayer in the 13th century. And the practice was standard fare for centuries. To summarize the practice, I can do no better than to repeat the comments of Rabbi Joel Circus, the Bach, and from, who died in 1640, to the Tour, the legal code of Rabbi Jacob ben Asher. Quote, when one recites the Shema, one should have the intention to accept on oneself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, to be killed for Kiddush Hashem, for the sanctification of God's name. This is what is meant by the phrase, with all your soul, even if he takes your soul. With this intention, one will recite it, that is the Shema, with fear and trembling. But aside from the Shema prayer, there was another practice of death that was integral to one's spiritual life. This occasion was the daily performance of the Nefilat Apayim ritual, performed immediately after the so-called Amidah, the major standing prayer with its 18 benedictions. At this point in the prayer service, after praising God and asking petitions for life and health, the prayer, the person praying, recites the alphabetical confessional known as the Ashamnu and 13 attributes of divine mercy and prostrates himself before God. In ancient rabbinic times, according to traditions preserved in the Talmud, it was customary for one to request divine mercy by physical prostration. This abject act of humility and self-nullification was later commuted to the more symbolic gesture of leaning to one side while seated, to the right side in the morning because the phylacteries on the, are on the left arm at that time and on the left side during the afternoon service. According to the Ashkenazi rites, one also recites Psalm 6 at this time, but according to Kabbalists, Psalm 25 is recited. This psalm, which begins with the words, to you, O Lord, I give 
save my soul was considered a most powerful prayer. And already in the 13th century in the Zohar, the worshiper is advised to be careful in its recitation, lest one die in fact through its improper recitation. For this reason, Rabbi Chaim Vital in the 16th century cautioned worshippers not to recite this passage at all. Various explanations for the Nefilat Apayim rites are found in the sources. They reflect different spiritual dimensions and concerns, as well as various modes of humility and death-like nullification. Let us begin with the comment of Rabbeinu Bachya ben Asher in the 13th century in his comment on Numbers 16, verse 22. That verse reports how Moses and Aaron fell upon their faces by Yiflu al in supplication for divine mercy after God had announced his intention to kill Kodah and his rebellious congregation. On the phrase, they fell upon their faces, Bachya says, this means to pray. And from this passage, we derive the act of Nefilat Apayim in prayer. And know that the matter of Nefilat Apayim in prayer has three purposes. The first is to express the fear of the Divine Presence. The second, to demonstrate sadness and submission. And the third, to show the restraint of sensation and nullification of feelings. As regards the first one, which deals with the fear of the Divine Presence, the rite of Nefilat Apayim helps one to express shame and humility, since the hiding of one's face it denotes this psychological state. The second purpose of the rite is to demonstrate sadness and submission, since one who falls upon his face is sorrowful and submissive, and submission is of the essence of repentance. And the third purpose of the rite is to show the restraint of sensation and the nullification of feelings, because one who falls on his face covers his, and covers his face and closes his mouth acknowledges that he does not know his future danger or purpose, nor knows God's purpose for him, and has no way to derive favor from God unless God give it. Further, through the act of supplication, one acts as if his feelings are nullified and restrained from his own desires. And as regards this, and, and as regards his closed eyes and sealed mouth, these symbolize that he is unable to see or speak anything other than what expresses the will of God. May he be blessed. I shall return to several of the rites mentioned here later. But for the present, let me emphasize the high degree of spiritual explanation given to the petitionary prostration of Nefilat Apayim. It reflects humility and submission, as well as the denial of self-will self-interest, and physical sensation. One is bidden to give oneself up totally to God in the act of petition, for only thus will personal prayer be paradoxically granted. Indeed, it is only in the utter and complete acknowledgement that all depends upon God's will that petitionary prayer is purified. In the process, the self-centered self dies to a higher purpose. A in a paradoxical way, then, it is precisely the desire for divine intercession and mercy that drives the human will beyond its own self-interest and to a humble acceptance of the will and purpose of God. The spiritual penitential explanations of the Nefilat Apayim rite by Rabbeinu Bachya stand in stark contrast with others of the same period, the 13th century. Thus, in the Zohar, this ritual has a more mystical and mythical bent, being connected in some passages with a cosmic conjunction when the masculine and feminine dimensions of God are conjoined and unified. This divine conjunction with strong sexual and psychological features occurs if and when there is no break between the prayer for redemption recited and the Amida recited immediately thereafter. According to the Zoharic explanation, the human worshiper falls on his face out of shame before this heavenly harmony and focuses all his spiritual intention on this process so that his own soul will be reborn in and through this heavenly sexual union. As you can sense, this is a bold mythic moment, for the worshiper undergoes a mode of death and rebirth through an intense act of spiritual intention and attachment to God. This act
act of death in prayer has the concrete force of ritualized atonement as well. This is clearly stated in the 16th century Megillat Am Raphael of Rabbi Abraham ben Eliezer Halevi, a document cited in an earlier lecture. A striking expression of this also occurs in the Zohar three centuries earlier. By a striking combination of myth and ritual, the Nefilat Apayim practice demonstrates the readiness of the worshiper to die at the hands of the Shekhinah, or female divine presence, symbolized as the tree of death. The reason is as follows. During the Amidah prayer, the standing benediction, the mystically minded prayer is supposed to be spiritually attached to the masculine principle called Tiferet, symbolized as the tree of life. At the conclusion of the prayer, the worshiper must now symbolically demonstrate his or her submission to or acknowledgement of the feminine side, death, so that he will not die in fat. That is, the worshiper must integrate life and death in the ritual process in order to emerge whole. He or she must attach himself both to the tree of life and to the tree of death. At the point where the worshiper disengages his focus from the masculine element in the standing prayer, he falls on his face and redeposits his soul with the same feminine aspect of God with which he deposits his soul at sleep every night. And why? Thus says the Zohar, quote, The secret or mystical explanation is that there are sins which remain unatoned for unless a person dies. Thus the prayer simulates death and gives himself truly over to death and devotes himself to that other principle, not as a temporary deposit of the soul as done at night, but as if he really and truly departed from this world. Ritual death is thus an act which wins atonement for the most severe sins. It is also a remarkable conjunction of opposites. There is a deep psychological and spiritual integration enacted here. Death is at once an act of devotion and depletion, of unification and difference, of self-loss and transcendence. The human worshiper goes through the dimensions of love of God even unto death, even to the point of realizing that love of God is an acceptance of God as the source of life and death. To devote oneself to death is thus an act of consummate commitment to the unity and unification of the divine name. To you, O Lord, I give my soul, says the worshiper in the words of David. This citation from Psalm 25 is recited, as I mentioned earlier, in some versions of the Nephilat Apayim ritual. It is also the biblical verse which precedes the foregoing myth of ritual death in the Zohar. With its recitation, the worshiper expresses total readiness to die to God then and there. And through that spiritual death, he or she is spiritually reborn, purified of sin. Having just considered some of the psychological aspects of the Nefilat Apayim penitential, I should now like to discuss another feature of it. It is singularly important, for it links this deepest of spiritual moments with life in this world. It gives us a different dimension of our theme of practicing death. What I have in mind is an interesting distinction made concerning bitul, or self-nullification, by Rabbi Dov Baer, the son of Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi, the founder of the Lubavitch line of Hasidism. Dov Baer was a powerful ecstatic, and in his tract on ecstasy, left us one of the most subtle documents of the various natural and supernatural states of divine experience. In that work, Rabbi Dov Baer actually states that the self-sacrifice or spiritual death of Nefilat Apayim achieves a higher spiritual state than death by divine kiss. And this is because through the ecstasy of the Nefilat Apayim rite, the worshiper can achieve a state of permanent spiritual attachment to God. To make his point, Dov Baer considers the difference between the ecstasy of union in the silent devotion of the Amidah prayer and the ecstasy of union in the prostration rite of the penitence in the Nefilat Apayim service. 
In the former state, says Rabbi Baer, the worshiper achieves a deep level of self-nullification or spiritual death, but he has yet to achieve the deeper degree of union with the essence and being of God. Thus, in the form of prayer, the person only receives an afterglow of supernal light and is not totally absorbed in God. He therefore remains a created being after the state of ecstasy, a separate entity and mere vessel of God's holiness. By contrast, the union achieved by the Nefilat Apayim rite is pure unification with God, an utter and complete absorption of the self into the Godhead. This absorption is permanent and has an interesting activistic quality. That is to say, as against the motionless absorption of the Amidah prayer, when one is required to fix one's feet together and pray without moving, the Nefilat Apayim prayer represents physical movement and thus a relationship with the world. Accordingly, even after achieving permanent connection with God in the Nefilat Apayim rite, the worshiper returns to the world and its demands. But his worldly action is now spiritually transformed. Though Bear puts it this way, after the ecstasy, even if the ecstatic occupies himself with business, with the very close relationship with the external forces of the material world, these forces do not have the power to separate him at all from the divine, not even a hair's breadth, because of his utter cleaving to the Godhead. Hence, even though he walks here and there in the realm of, of, of material world, my presence remains with you, truly with utter cleaving. This is the superiority of the Nefilat Apayim rite over the spiritual death and ecstasy in the Amida and Shema. Concerning this scripture says, and to him shall you cleave, literally to him, to all your earthly actions. We have come across this proof text before. As you will recall, Rabbi Isaac of Acre had interpreted it in connection with meditation on the divine name. And we also noted cases in which a mystical meditation upon the tetragram helps one to transcend the pain of torture. In the present context, Rabbi Dove Baer says nothing explicitly about a visualization of the divine name written in one's third eye. Rather, the devotee has his mind firmly fixed upon God's presence fully attached to God while he goes on to live in the world. Accordingly, life in the world takes on a remarkable spiritualized dimension for the mystic. For despite one's permanent absorption in God's presence, one performs all the daily business of the world. At first blush, it would seem that this dying of the lower self to God while working in the world is merely an aspect of the Hasidic way of worshiping God through material things, that is, through the earthly conduct of one's life. But this is not quite so. For in our case, there is no sense that what one is doing is redeeming the holy sparks of divinity from the fallen matter of the world and raising them to their heavenly source. Indeed, this procedure is actually a type of despiritualization, since with the separation of spirit and matter, the material world would collapse like a balloon and lose its spiritual energy. And this is cosmic redemption. In our case, the emphasis is different. One does not redeem divine sparks so much as do all things while in a state of trance-like cleaving to God. If anything, there is a kind of splitting of consciousness so that part of oneself goes about the daily tasks of life, all the while one's mind is completely fixed upon God. I'm not denying that there is redemptive dimension involved here, only stressing that, that there is a different mental intention for human action. The sources of this type of meditative piety are quite old, and if they do not derive from the 13th century mystic Rabbi Isaac of Acre, then they can be found already in Maimonides. For in the section from the guide discussed in the first lecture, in which he talked about persons who died ecstatically by the kiss of God, Maimonides also teaches a method of divine attentiveness. He first speaks of how one should isolate one's mind from all things but God, out of the great love for him while performing the commandments. 
He then adds that the complementary task is to focus on the tasks of the world when one is regularly required to be absorbed in them. Thus, the way of intellectual perfection requires one to focus wholly upon God while doing his service and wholly upon the tasks of the world when this is required. This is itself a high state, an end that, quote, can be achieved by those of the men of knowledge who have rendered their souls worthy of it by training of this kind. But there is a still higher state, says the sage. For, he says, there may be a human individual who through his apprehension of the true reality and his joy in what he has apprehended achieves a state in which he talks with people and is occupied with his bodily necessities while his intellect or mind is wholly turned towards God, may he be exalted, so that his heart is always in his presence, so that in his heart he is with people in the sort of way described by the poetical parables invented for this purpose. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is on the voice of my beloved that knocketh, and so on, from the Song of Song. In Maimonides' view, this state of meditative action was not achieved by all the prophets, though he does admit that it was a state achieved by Moses. At any rate, it is striking that Maimonides' contemporary, Nachmanides, the teacher of Rabbi Isaac of Acre, also recognized this exalted spiritual condition. We learn this from his comments on Deuteronomy 11, verse 22. To love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to cleave to him. In one remarkable unity, Nachmanides integrates all three key verbs from the scriptures. To love God, to walk in his ways, and to cleave to him. He says, The verse warns man not to worship God and somebody else besides him. He is to worship God alone in his heart and his actions. And it is plausible that the meaning of cleaving is to remember God and his love constantly, not to divert your thoughts from him in all your earthly doings. Such a man may be talking to other people, but his heart is not with them, since he is in the presence of God. And it is further plausible that those who have attained this rank do, even in their earthly life, partake of the eternal life, because they have made themselves a dwelling place for the Shekinah, the feminine aspect of God. It would appear from the formulation and from the reference to attaining eternal life in this life that Nachmanides knows the teachings of Maimonides on this point. However this be, he is certainly aware of the high state of spiritual attachment in which one can go about the world wholly absorbed in God's presence. It was this kind of activism about which Dove there spoke some six centuries later, certainly out of his own experience, but no doubt also authorized by older meditative traditions. This long continuity of a given spiritual ideal gives us a remarkable glimpse into the spiritual history of Judaism and its meditative procedures, as well as into a type of active asceticism that allowed one to fulfill the commandments of God in the world without losing contact with God. According to Dover, the Nefilat Apayim prostration which led to this deep state of permanent absorption with God was a consummate spiritual death, an act of self-sacrifice that left the ecstatic all but dead. Only the smallest residue remains, or as he notes, the ecstatic is not actually thought to be dead, but slumbering in a deep sleep. And he adds that this state of spiritual consciousness was similar to that achieved by the Baal Shem Tov, of whom it was said that when he had a sense of the soul, he was stripped of all the physicality of the material world of his body. This, though, there teaches, was like the sleep of Adam, an Edenic state of consciousness. Truly such a death leads to a primordial rebirth. In our concern for Jewish ritual practices that deal with acts of imaginative or spiritual dying, I would like to tell you about one particular custom sometimes linked with the penitential rite of Nefilat Apayim. I am referring to the custom of closing one's eyes in prayer. It occurs in the two chief sources I have chosen to give you as a sense of the Nefilat Apayim ritual, the 13th century mystical book of Zohar and the 13th century biblical commentary of Rabbeinu Bakya. In the Zohar, one was advised both to prostrate oneself and hide one's eyes out of shame for the unification of masculine and feminine elements within the Godhead. 
Rabbi Menachem Rekinaki notes a similar explanation in his comment on petitionary prostration of Moses and Aaron. The reference to the custom of closing one's eyes during the rite of Nefilat Apayim also occurs in the commentary of Rabbi Nubakia. In the passage cited earlier, we learn that the act of covering one's eyes is particularly related to the inner act of meditation, whereby one acknowledges God's will to be the sole source of everything. The act of not seeing is related to the act of not talking, two acts that symbolize the withdrawal of the ego-centered self from the world of sense and personal concerns. I would add here that the whole process of closing one's eyes in meditative prayer has a long tradition in Judaism. It is routinely related to mental concentration and withdrawal from this worldly sensations, though it is not always linked to the themes of death or dying. A striking further example of the custom occurs in a 16th century account of the meditative process whereby one might attain to the level of prophecy. In his mystical manual, Rabbi Chaim Vital specifically states, and he should shut his eyes and remove his thoughts from all matters of this world, as though his soul had departed from him, like a dead person who feels nothing. And he should imagine that his soul has departed and ascended, and he should imagine the upper world as though he stands in them. Many other writers of this mystical tradition speak likewise with respect to special acts of meditation. But as we have seen, closing the eyes was also performed during the public ritual of Nefilat Apayim. In addition, various teachers advised closing one's eyes while reciting the Amidah prayer and also during parts of the Sabbath evening service. Over time, this practice was admonished since it was felt that closing the eyes was only a valid procedure if one had purified oneself from base thoughts, or if one did not do it as a matter of pride. Such persons were strongly advised to focus on the written letters of the prayer book. In this way, they might fix their concentration more pointedly on spiritual issues involved, and thereby rise to a higher and more pure service of the heart. Where pride is involved, or an unfocused mind, there could hardly be any sense in thinking of spiritual death. In such cases, one was only much alive to oneself. The whole point of all these spiritual and ritual exercises, of course, was to purify the self from ego-centered absorption so that one might commune with God while alive. The spiritual exercises connected with the recitation of the Shema, whereby one confessed readiness to die a martyr's death, was also geared to prepare the worshiper for a spiritual death in extremis. Spiritual death in prayer was thus an act of self-devotion and a preparation. It allowed the worshiper to negate death, to integrate death into his or her spiritual and psychological makeup, and thus be prepared for the most ultimate act, death for the sanctification of God's name. We may thus isolate two poles, supernatural or ecstatic death in life, and unnatural death at the stake. A third point can be plotted as well, and this, of course, is the natural death of every person. In Judaism, the full range of longings for spiritual perfection that attends service of God in one's lifetime, combined with the formulary of the Shema and confession as part of the last rites. These are described in detail in numerous guidebooks concerning one's final hours. What particularly interests me in this context are not so much those rites which require the dying person to prepare for physical death in a pure and purified way, as the rituals which are designed to help one to practice death while yet in good health. That is, to undergo a, a kind of spiritual death in life. In these cases, there is a deep reconciliation and internalization of the fact of death. This is ideally achieved through a type of spiritual process whereby the worshiper acknowledges death and confesses to the supreme unity of God. As a ritual, it stands alongside the, death, the daily recitation of the Shema for spiritual power. By way of example, let me give you a remarkable text written by Rabbi Shabtai Sheftel, the son of the great Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz in the 16th century. His remarks are preserved as glosses to his father's great work, the Shnei Luchot Habrit. Listen to the advice of Rabbi Shabtai Sheftel, 
and hear the service of the heart. Let a person seem some time, while he is still in good health, to isolate himself and confess the following long confession. And when doing so, consider himself as if he were in fact dying. And it is worthwhile for every thinking person to make use of the ensuing confessional and follow this practice at least before every new moon, which is considered a minor day of atonement. And the fast the whole day should be as on the ninth of Av, with all of its restrictions. And at that time, he should examine his ways and cling to the Shekhinah, the feminine aspect of God, for at least one hour. And during this practice, he should be in isolation in body and mind, with his eyes fixed down in humility and his heart directed upward to God. And he should think of his coming death and his dying day yet to come. And he should devote himself to die in love whenever God be exalted, wills it. And let him be robed in a prayer shawl and wear phylacteries and induce great enthusiasm in himself. The confession of Rabbi Shabtai Sheftel goes on to have the worshiper say that he will accept death for the sanctification of God's name, and that if he should die by torture, or should the fear of death come upon him, so that he gets spiritually confused or weak-willed, quote, let this confession which I forthwith recite, while in sound mind and body, be as if I recited it at the hour of my death, word for word, when I may not be of sound mind. As a spiritual act, this desire to preempt any misstatement during the trials of torture expresses a profound concern to sanctify God's name at death and thereby outwit the sneaky ways of the devil. A similar set of concerns, together with many other motifs from the spiritual tradition, are found in a great confessional written by Rabbi Naftali Katz in the early 18th century. He writes the following in his Sefer HaHakana. Let my faith in the 13 principles of faith which I have mentioned before you, benefit me on the day when I shall call upon you in truth and a pure heart. And let it benefit me now in my sorrow, insofar as until I die, my pure faith shall not swerve from you. And even if the devil tempt me when my soul departs my body, would that I not deny any of these principles, for I shall not heed him, but to you, O Lord, I give my soul. And if, God forbid, he, the devil, drives me mad and distorts my mind, or through great sufferings of fear of death, which he casts upon me, or through the apparitions of himself, which he manifests before me in various and weird guises, to confess and frighten me, confuse and frighten me, and if God forbid through madness, I acknowledge him in word or consideration or thought or gesture to deny or destroy these stated principles, therewith to deny your glory to another, God forbid, either any one of them or all together, let come what may. But behold, on all this I have given my testimony before you, my God and God of my fathers, while now in good health, before witnesses and myself, and I have annulled all these lying apparitions and kept my faith forever. The pathos of this statement, in its excessive language and legal redundancy, is clear to all. The devouring power of the devil to wipe out a lifetime of pure service is sensed and resisted, and the desire to anticipate the moment of death and give a pure confession is found and reveals the soul faced with the fears of physical terror and satanic trickery. Similar features are found in contemporary Christian confessions as well. At the end of his confession, Rabbi Naftali brings his spiritual desires to a climax. He wishes to die the pure death of the saints, like the rabbinic heroes of the past. And so he says, Behold, I commit my body and soul and spirit and breath willingly and in love to you. At the instant, it is your will, O Lord my God, to take my soul from me. And when the enemy comes and assaults with his terrible and bitter sword, I shall extend my neck like a sheep to slaughter when he comes to die. And let that act be acceptable and favorable before you, as if my soul departed with the word one in the prayer, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. In later decades and in many books, this language is repeated by the dying person, 
along with requests to have one's sins striven and forgiven through death and confession. The desire is to die by the kiss of God in holiness and purity. But for all the power of these texts and rituals, they pale to my mind before these acts of anticipatory death. For in these texts, one tries to die before one dies. The terror of demonic subversion, be it through supernatural apparitions or all too human madmen, threaten the soul striving for sanctity with God. As Rabbi Naftali Kass says it, all he has are his words of praise and confession, and he gives these to God as an offering of love. By practicing death in advance, he does not so much overcome it as die purely in the holiness of faith and commitment. This, the texts say, is death by the kiss of God. We must now conclude. And I think it's fitting to summarize the long path that we've been on over the past week. To bring into focus, my concern has been, over the course of the three lectures, to bring into focus through a variety of texts and practices a specific spiritual concern that recurs throughout Jewish religious history. That concern is for the intense love of God, an intense concern for God even unto death, that was expressed through the quest of philosophers, the meditations of mystics, the devotion of martyrs, and the everyday focus and practice of the common worshiper. For philosophers, mystics, and moralists, a central motif was the old rabbinic exhortation Die before you die. That is, mortify your body so that the soul may escape its prison and flee to divine freedom. The act of freeing the soul might involve philosophical training, mystical meditation, or ritual commandments, but they all depend upon a common anthropology. That is, that the soul is a special divine element that is intention in terms of its desire and will with the physical body, and that proper attention is required to bring the soul to its true destiny. This leads to two further points. First, that there is a hierarchy in the spiritual life, and that along this hierarchy, certain states are closer to God than others. The person made in the image of God is therefore duty-bound to bring his or her divine dimension into alignment with God, and thus achieve the level of prophecy and or eternal life. Second point, as against the communal aspect of redemption, so common and so famous in Judaism, we have seen in these lectures something else. Paths of ecstasy and communion that are designed to lead a person to personal redemption, that is, to a redemption of the individual soul in eternal life. Clearly, individual redemption is the goal for the philosophers and mystics that we have looked at, and the hope for personal redemption is the hope of the martyrs of the Rhineland, a very different spiritual configuration than what motivated the heart of the Jewish people for centuries. At another level, we see that the concern to die for God was ritually structured into the daily ritual as an act of self-devotion, as a means of preparing for martyrdom, and as a type of spiritual and psychological integration, and as a means of self-purification, atonement, and escape from rebirth in one form or another. Spiritual death thus had about it a decentering of the individual self, and the recentering of it towards God. This passion to be reborn within a divine milieu is thus the motivation for all the attention placed on the divine reality. One therefore turns to ritual as a rite of passage. Through ritual, one may live through death and take it into one's mind and heart, so to speak, and be reborn on a new spiritual and psychological level. In the modern world, the anthropology of Israel, the anthropology of the ancient and medieval distinction between soul and matter, 
is no longer accepted as, as an accepted truth in many circles, nor is the denigration of the body as a path to salvation. Yet, the idea of spiritual death may remain for us on at least two levels. First, the psychological level, the sacrifice of the ego in the context of a larger reality. Kafka is the great example here. And second, at the existential level, where love of another person is a dying to time and the blandness of life and being reborn in an eternal rhythm. Franz Rosenzweig is the great example in this case. Both combine in their sense of spiritual death as a form of humility before death and human will. Let me conclude all of these meditations with the flip side of our subject. In the modern world, there's another side of spiritual death, and that is the death of the spirit. This was already known by Solomon ibn Gabiro and many of his early medieval players, and spoken of by the Baal Shem Tov himself in the 18th century. Speaking of the verse in the prayer, do not abandon us at the time of our death, the Baal Shem counsels that one's death is when one no longer has the spiritual resources to be reborn and alive to the world. Here is a different challenge then, the challenge to be alive to the context of life. In the process, the idea of spiritual death is turned upside down. If the one pole is to, is to render the ego more humble, the other is to restore the ego to the mystery of life so that it may find its true rebirth. For the Baal Shem, this is a gift of grace that we can give each other as friends. For through our love, the world can be renewed for those who are dead inside. And says the Master, this human act of love is one way that God renews the creation each day and so saves us from dark despair.